the other ideas that Obama has is to create a logic to what we're doing. That's so innovative. Um, he wants to put together a board of people to determine what's good and what isn't. Let's get together and talk on the table. What, I mean, the only one thing I know that was anything like this ever was the Oregon plan uh, for health care reform. It was really rationing. Rationing, that's R-A-T-I-O-N-I-N-G. It's a four-letter word in healthcare. Nobody wants to talk about rationing. But Oregon said, you know, let's find out as a population, as a citizenry, what we feel is going to be the best thing to do for people in the state of Oregon. And they made a list of 600 or 700 things that they would like to pay for. And then they said, well, this year, given our revenue base, we can only pay up to 623 or 595. But we're going to take care of that because that's what we agreed on. We prioritize. We can't pay for everything. We can't do everything. But let's decide what's important to us as a country. And let's have, again, some ethical foundation of what we do. What do we owe people? What do we as a society owe? What does it mean for us to be benevolent? What does it mean for us to, where people can feel they can rely on us? It's not like this idea of we're holding them in their hand and when they come towards us, we let them go. We need to be there to support them. There's even a shift away from in Medicare Part D last year, Medicare's drug benefit, there was a donut hole that was created. You know about the donut hole? That we had a certain amount of coverage, and then there was a hole where you have no coverage, and then when you get another side of a donut, you've got all kinds of coverage. We talked, used to talk about safety nets. All of a sudden we started talking about donut holes. And I thought, well, gee, are we going to go from Medicare to Medi Medi don't care? I mean, is there, is there, what are we doing here? And now there's an attempt to get rid of the donut hole. And part of it was some of the breadth of innovative private entrepreneurs and enterprises that said, you know, we can come up with better solutions. If we have good data, if we have a good population we can work with, if we have a good data repository, we can cover the donut hole. People come to us, we'll work with them. So we're getting smart. We're getting smarter. One of the other areas, and I guess I've been talking about this without saying it, is you can't do ethics without knowledge. There's an interface between knowledge and ethics. The ancient Greeks told us that. If you're going to have knowledge, or if you want to do something, you have to know what needs to be known. You have to have data, you have to have information, you have to know what the best ways are. If you don't have that, you're just kind of uh, wasting your time. One of the other things that's very interesting in this whole healthcare arena and the interface with ethics is that the greatest number of personal bankruptcies in this country comes from people that can't afford, that have a catastrophic health event in their family. And there's discussion of an exemption in bankruptcy law for people that can demonstrate that their bankruptcy was due to the health-related expenses. So we have exemption from bankruptcy law provision. We have health information technologies and transformative technologies. We have a reduction or, 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 get, or getting rid of entirely of a pre-existing illness requirement, of a focus a little bit more on broader kinds of healthcare delivery and prevention, and not just on sickness. Pretty dramatic stuff. And we might not be able to achieve all of it, but boy, we're sure taking steps in the right direction. And we're trying. And we should pat ourselves on the back for that as well. Stewardship. That's what our government has a responsibility to do, I think. To be there to step forward, to take a, to take a chance to do the right thing. To be motivated by values that we can agree on as a society. That means reforming. Reforming means reshaping. It means changing. It means not the same old stuff. It means dealing with the naysayers and dealing with the promoters, but coming up with a balanced view. Remember some years ago when I was involved with, uh, Mike mentioned I was involved with helping develop the hospice Medicare benefit and hospice in this country. There were a group of thinkers, innovators, um, visionaries that brought hospice to this country. When it came time to turn into public policy, they didn't have a clue what to do. And rather than integrating them with the policy people, they got thrown out. They got shifted into the background. Because the voices were being so loud, the home health care people wanted it to fall into their bailiwick. The nursing home people wanted to fall into their bailiwick. The hospital people wanted it. The surgeons wanted it. These people wanted it. And as a result, it was very difficult to find out what's going on. You do it in the absence of that. Because you can't, if, you, if the voices are yelling so loud, you can't hear the message. You've got to come up your, at, at, with the message on your own at, as best you can. Um, again, moving away from denial-based mentality, uh, to make, uh, we have what, how many, uh, 25, 27 million uh, uninsured, 15% of our population is uninsured. Most of them are working people. 
So the idea, another fundamental component with the Obama plan is to have health insurance available for our population, not just those who can pay for it out of pocket, and to have different kinds of plans and different kinds of access. All comers plan, no restrictive underwriting, expanded benefits, improved service at less cost. Sounds pretty good if we can pull it off. Another one that is very controversial is the idea that maybe we need to rethink the way we provide health care in the first place. Why does health care have to be tied to having a job? Why should it be employer-based? You know, when I was a kid, if you got lucky, you'd find the right job or two over the years and you'd stay there and you'd be there for 30 or 40 years. Maybe you'd get lucky and get a gold watch at the end or something like that too and you'd have benefits as a retiree. Now, the likelihood of you having less than five jobs is pretty low. Pretty low. So the portability of being able to take what you have from place to place becomes very, very difficult. Should it be tied to a job? And if you're not working, do you want to, do we want people to be getting sick? Shouldn't we rethink this in some way? And this is on the table as well. Um, the, um, I guess the other component I want to talk about is that we have to move away from, I mean, think about this. In our managed care arena, the patient was seen as to a great extent, a liability. If you worked in a situation where you got paid in advance on a capitated basis, and money was put in your pocket, and you had that money, you didn't know who was going to come in, but you had that money in your pocket, every time the patient came in the door, they were a financial hazard. They were a threat to your profits. That's perverse. Something was wrong with that. And now I think we want to have a system where there's access there's the ability of people to get care when they need it. Even going back to the donut hole, if you have somebody that has diabetes and they're managing their disease by taking medications, why would you have a donut hole where they stop taking their medications and they end up compromising their leg and getting gangrene or going blind? Isn't it more expensive if you're just talking about money to take care of somebody blind? It could have avoided being blindness, being blind. Isn't it kind of a disservice to people if they can be sighted to make them blind? Something seems wrong here. That's a good place for me to close and start asking to, some questions of, uh, of the group here and see what, uh, what we can deal with. I thank you all very much for today. Thank you.